let's talk about injury. These two guys, if, if anyone is listening to this and hasn't been highly influenced by these two gentlemen, um, I don't know how that's possible. These two guys have uh, have changed the game when it comes to to uh, you know I think getting a lot of people from at least my generation interested in fitness and working out. I didn't get a call to uh, to do their physical therapy after these surgeries. That was a little bit a little bit disappointed. All right, so injury risk factors. One of the largest um, risk factors for injury is previous injury. So the joke is, well, there's no such thing as injury prevention, but just don't get hurt the first time. All right. So uh, previous injury, a spike in workload, right? A spike in workload, decreased sleep, um, quantity and quality, age, right? If you're uh, too young or too old. Uh, tends to be higher risk. Stress can definitely lead to can definitely lead to injury, right? They've done studies with college students uh, around exams and and levels of high stress. Nutrition, right? Hydration, your body weight, right? Whether someone is obese, right? That's going to change their risk of injury. Their current fitness and training age, right? That's all going to affect the likelihood of of suffering an injury. Occupation, right? We can't overlook these type of things. Is the person a desk worker, or is the person, you know, a carpenter, or is the person um, lifting, you know, boulders all day and 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 smashing like rocks with sledgehammers all day, right? Occupation is going to definitely um, impact uh, someone's risk for injury. Daily activities, right? Daily activities. That office worker, you may think, is you know, low risk, not much activity, uh, but you don't know that maybe they do like, I don't know, rock climbing or like, uh, you know, uh, or they helped a friend move or they own or they, they move uh, pianos on, on the weekends or something, right? Um, their People's daily activities are also going to impact their, their risk for injury. Emotional resilience. I, th- I don't know that this gets enough attention and I don't know that there's much research on it, but it is my opinion that the mindset of someone like a bodybuilder or like someone who can run a marathon or someone who can climb a mountain like Mount Everest or something, right? That mindset, that disgusting uh, drive that is almost a curse, I feel like there's something protective about that. Um, I think it can be a good thing. I think it can also be a bad thing, right? If you push too hard without thinking, and without um, auditing yourself and making sure that your efforts, you're not perfecting the unimportant, right? Um, I think that emotional resilience does play a role in injury. And then the kind of the breakdown here of this last bullet uh, is, uh, you know, a lot of us have probably heard of the the research where they um, uh, kind of track the number of injuries per hours of, per, of, per, of practice or participation. And the trend is that the least amount of injury occurs in bodybuilding, then weightlifting, powerlifting, CrossFit, and then Highland Games and Strongman. And it, uh, it's a whole nother conversation as to, to why, but just to kind of give us an idea of, of some, you know, the conversation of injury. Um, Highland Games, I, uh, I recently wanted to look into just because as I was doing this, I wanted to get an idea of what I was talking about. That's some crazy stuff. I don't know who, how that was invented, but I just feel like it's so primal. Like I feel like I'm sure it's been going on for for years and years and years and years. Like they're they're throwing like like the like telephone poles and and stuff. Like if anyone out there does Highland Games, I, I, that fascinates me. It's actually really cool. Okay, so are we at risk for injury? after a layoff. Well, when we return to the gym after layoff, what is our current state, right? What is, what's happening? We're gonna increase our our workload. So we're gonna get a workload spike. We're gonna have decreased strength, decreased size, decreased neural adaptations, right? Um, And decreased skill, 
right? When it comes to certain lifts, less coordination, less endurance, right? We may get winded sooner, um, more muscle damage and more fatigue. We're going to be more susceptible to muscle damage and fatigue when we return after a layoff. Two um, Austin Powers uh, pictures in a row. I'm not sure uh, why. It must have just been must have been in a mood that day, but uh, nothing like Austin Powers. It's one of those movies that every time it's on, you got to watch it, and you find something different that you never caught in it. Um, okay, can we prevent injury? No, injury prevention is, in my opinion, a garbage term. Because injury is so multifactorial and it's, it's poorly defined in the literature and, and variable from sport to sport. So how do we prevent injury? How do we prevent someone from taking a shoulder to their knee in a sport? How do we prevent that, right? And so it, it's, it's multi, how do we prevent someone from, from going out um, on the soccer field and the day after they get a bad night's sleep or they have a fight with their, their wife or, or husband or something and uh, they, you know, they have high cortisol levels and, and, and their mind is not in it and, and they, you know, they get hurt. Or how do we, how do we prevent the, the grass or the turf from being slippery because it's first thing in the morning and there's dew on the grass, right? How do we, how do we prevent that? It's so uh, difficult to... to to do that because injury is so, so multifactorial. Um, and it's not even defined, like we said, not even defined clearly in the literature. What's an injury? What's an injury? Is it pain? Is it time off from training? Is it going to seek a medical professional? Is it some kind of structural issue? We don't know. We don't know. All the research can, tends to have different definitions and it all comes down to the fact that Injury is so multifactorial and very, very rarely, um, if at all, due to one thing, um, you know, like a a weakness or an imbalance or or, or something in the physical body. So we can't prevent injury. Injuries are going to happen. However, we can reduce injury. Hence my title with 3DMJ, Injury Reduction and Management Specialist. Um... So yes, we can reduce injury, and the way that we do it is by managing our workload. There is something called the acute to chronic workload ratio. There's a lot of research on it, especially recently. And um, basically, after you dive into the rabbit hole of acute to chronic workload ratio and find your way out and you're back into the sunlight, Basically, all we have to say is don't do too much too soon. It's pretty much it. Um, They, the researchers are are trying to put numbers to it, right? And um, kind of make like arbitrary measurements of, of load and workload for different sports. Obviously, very, very hard because in something like weightlifting or bodybuilding, it's quite easy because we can, it's controlled, right? We, we can measure sets, we can measure reps, we can measure RPE. Um, those type of things are all going to be modifiable when we talk about load management with weightlifting. But something like soccer or football or, or tennis or, or anything like, or swimming, right? It's going to be much harder to define what load is. Uh, so with that in mind, what the acute to, quant- to chronic workload ratio, uh, what it says is that it, it takes the the um, the chronic workload, which is what you've been doing for some amount of time, and then um, kind of compares it to what you're doing right now. And that ratio, uh, they like I said, they tried to put a number to it, but really it's it's not meant to to be to be an exact number that people follow. Um, it's not to, meant to be a cutoff score. It's not meant to, to deter people from, from training a certain way. It's just trying to conceptualize this concept of workload. Okay. Um, so basically the quicker we increase the workload, the higher the risk for injury. So that's why we're trying to find some way to define this, to help us grade how we want to push our athletes, but not push them too much. 
and it tends to be a bell curve. Workload tends to be a bell curve. Um, there are times when we have to enter that red zone, right? We have to push it if we want to get better. Um, but there's higher risk of injury with too little workload, and there's high risk of injury with too much workload. So don't forget that, that doing too little is also injurious. So we have that bell curve. Why is everything always a bell curve? I don't know. That's just how it is. <laughs> All right. So continuing this conversation about workload and why and how we can uh, reduce injury and not prevent injury, this balancing act of load and capacity. So changes in load are always going to be dependent on our capacity to handle that load. And keep in mind that workload is not the goal, right? It's the means to the goal. So we shouldn't have a goal to reach a certain workload. We have a goal of, of something that the workload is going to give us, right? So whether it's hypertrophy or strength, uh, that is our goal. Our goal isn't a certain amount of training volume or something like that. Our goal is to gain muscle. Our goal is to increase strength, right? Our goal is to perform, you know, some kind of Olympic lift in a certain way. That's the goal. The workload is just the means to the goal. And Tim Gabbett is, is one of the leading researchers on, on this, this stuff. And, and he says, con, uh, training consistently does not mean training constantly, right? So we have to remember that we want to be consistent, but that doesn't mean that we just push it, push it, push it all the time. So this image here, I made this by myself, by the way, in PowerPoint. I didn't take this from anywhere. This is all me. Um, and basically, if we uh, if this gets out of whack, uh, you know, it gets out of balance, that's when we kind of run into some issues. So capacity is things like sleep, recovery, nutrition, um, and load are, like we said in the slide before, hard to define for a lot of other sports. Um, but in weightlifting and bodybuilding, it's, it's a bit simpler. So load would be things like we said in the previous slide, RPE, um, actual load on the bar, uh, overall volume, right? frequency, all those things go into the load side. And then we have to make sure that we are, are enhancing our capacity to handle that load. Um, you know, if, if we're going to, if we're going to change load, uh, if we're going to change capacity. So if, for example, you know that you're going to be traveling and you're going to be jet lagged and you're going to not going to be sleeping, not going to be eating how you normally would, then you have to understand that that capacity is getting smaller. So you may have to alter your load, right? Depending on, on your capacity to handle that. So it's not just that the load changes, the capacity is always changing. Both of these things are always changing, right? The capacity is in constant flux depending on the individual. So that's why things like autoregulation are so important because that's going to help us kind of get a grip on our capacity, which can then lead us to increasing or decreasing load. So not so much, uh, just in general, we're talking, not, not exactly like coming back from a layoff, but just in general, this, this concept of load and capacity. The next concept here is the envelope of function. Moving on to you know, the same concept here of, of, of not preventing injury, but reducing injury and using workload as, as our guide. And so the envelope of function uh, from uh, the legend has it from Dr. Dai, he's the one who kind of came up with this. He wanted to um, look inside a knee and kind of poke and prod at different structures and see what was tender, what, what didn't feel good. And uh, so he did it on himself. Um, maybe he couldn't find he couldn't find subjects that wanted someone to go inside their knee with an arthroscope and, and poke around their knee. I don't know. I don't know why someone wouldn't want to do that study. Anyway, he did it on himself. And what he noticed was that um, he found that his cartilage in his knee, um, under his kneecap, right, was looked like a mess in the arthroscope, right? And he said to himself, why don't I have pain? And he was thinking, well, all of these patients that I've been treating, I look at a, you know, on an image or an MRI, X-ray, and and or with a with a with an arthroscope, and I see this damaged cartilage, and I treat that. But maybe it's not so much what's structurally going on in that knee, 
Maybe there's more to it. And that, my friends, maybe there's more to it, is how innovation starts. So we came up with this theory that maybe it's not structural, uh, maybe it's something more. And this was meant to be more at the tissue level, so not so much like the workload ratios and like the load and capacity, where it's more like a global external thing. This is more like something like literally the patellar tendon's ability to take load. But I think the concept applies to the conversation we're having. So if we look at this graph, the um, the area here, so this, this white area here, is the zone of homeostasis. So that is where we can hang out and we probably are going to be okay. We're not going to increase our resiliency or, 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 um, you know, we're not going to overload ourselves, but we're also not going to underload ourselves. We're going to be right in that area of homeostasis where we're probably not going to get much of a change and it's going to be tolerated pretty well, whatever we, whatever load we put into our system. As we move here on this graph, we come to a point where this dark black line is, is the envelope of function. And this is the breaking point, uh, not the breaking point, it's the point at which we leave the zone of homeostasis and start getting into this super physiological overload, right? Super physiological overload. So this is where we want to be when we push it. So we're going to be stressing the system and allowing it to adapt in this area. So if you could imagine, we have load here and frequency here. So activities of high load and low frequency are going to be something like a one rep max, right? Where it's high load, but we're not doing it much, right? Or... Um, the example Dr. Dai uses is like jumping off of like a, a two meter high box. That's a lot of load being put through your system, but you're just doing it once. So if you do um, too much of this, your tissues will fail. This is like getting in a car accident, right? Or, um, or taking a hit from someone in a football game on a kickoff return, right? And, you, and your tissue just either a bone or something just breaks because that impact is basically like like getting hit by by a truck um so that would be an example of tissue failing um due to high load the other end of the spectrum is something like going for like a five mile walk right so this is low load but high frequency because we're step after step after step after step but the load is low and the frequency is high in here would be something like, you know, playing basketball where we have high load, right? We're jumping and, and things like that. And we have pretty high frequency because the game may go on for like two hours or so, right? As bodybuilders and weightlifters, our envelope of function is going to be a bit skewed where it kind of pops out like this because we do high load and high frequency. So that middle part is going to be jutted out a bit. It's important to note that because this envelope of function is going to be different for everybody. It's going to be different because it's moving. It's in constant flux depending on the day, okay? Um, so someone who, you know, is uh, a power lifter, right? Their envelope of function may be much higher here, right? Whereas someone who trains with low loads and high reps, you know, like, um, I don't know, like a, some kind of body weight or calisthenics type training, their envelope of function for load may be somewhere down here. And then this may be a bit skewed over here, right? Because they're doing higher repetitions. So the idea here is that this can change. This can change depending on how we stress the system. So if we constantly train in this area and then come back down to homeostasis and then push in this area and come down to homeostasis and then push and come down to homeostasis, we will move that envelope of function higher and higher and higher. We're increasing our capacity. We're increasing our ability to take on load. 
However, if we do it too fast, like we talked about graded exposure before, right, and the repeated bout effect, if we do it too fast, then we're going to get, we're going to push this edge here of the zone of super physiologic overload, and we're going to be coming close to the area of tissue failure, right? And again, this is for physical tissues. So I'm not saying that we're going to have a pec tear necessarily because we benched it too much. Uh, it's po obviously possible, but that's not what I'm talking about. It's more the concept of this envelope of function being in constant flux, depending on our training ability and depending on, on our ability to, to adapt to that. Because things like sleep, stress, nutrition, hydration, all those things can move the envelope of function without having anything to do with our physical ability to adapt to load, okay? All that being said, don't get lost in the weeds, okay? Don't overanalyze. Uh, one of the highest risk factors for injury is fear of injury. Um, and like we said before, preparation is protective. So don't overanalyze this stuff. I don't want you under the squat, in the squat rack, thinking about the envelope of function. I want you to think about these concepts, develop a plan like we'll do uh, in a moment here in the presentation, and then go in there and focus on your training. Okay? Don't get lost in the weeds. Um, we don't want to overthink these things. And, you know, that in and of itself can kind of put us at risk.